Good morning, everyone. How are you doing today? Thumbs up? This is a good day? Yes, indeed. Good. Thumbs up. That's good. Looks like you can hear me in the back all right. We're good? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Just wanted to check in with you a bit. We are continuing in our series that says Control, Alt, Delete. It's all about rebooting your life. And today, as you can see on our screen, we're going to be talking about parenting. Parenting. So uh, let, me, let me just begin by saying this. If you're a grandparent and you say, well, those days are past. Now, why is this for me? Hang with me just for a little bit, all right? I think you'll, I think you'll, you'll, get, you'll get it. Uh, maybe you are, I'm looking around, I'm seeing some younger faces, and you're saying, parenting, man, I'm not even married yet. I'm not thinking about that kind of stuff. I'm on the receiving end of parenting. Well, uh, just think about this a little bit because we're going to, I, mean, I think I'm going to have some things to say to you. Hang with me. Hang with me, I promise. And if you're a parent, I just want you to understand that everything that I'm saying is not intended to induce guilt, all right, um, as we talk about these things. But it's just these areas where we learn and, and we grow and we can learn from other experiences as they're recorded for us here in the Scriptures because we're continuing today to look into this control, alt, and delete um, uh, matter. And so what I'd like to do is open us with a word of prayer, and then I just want to talk a little bit once again about this business of rebooting. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we do thank you for this morning, and we thank you for your goodness, your grace, the love and life that we know in Jesus Christ, extraordinary, unconditional, eternal. We thank you that in him we have confidence to press into the matters of uh, our lives and today to be thinking about family and family systems and family structures and parenting and children and what it means to pass on things from one generation to the next. We want to pass on that which is best and we want to stop passing on that which is confusing, harmful, even destructive. So, Father, we're asking that your Spirit would speak to us through your Word, and we're praying this in the strong and precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. How many of you would say, this is just a little, this is just a little survey, how many of you would say that it's probably as challenging and difficult to be a parent today as it's ever been? How many of you would say that's true? Okay, almost everyone in the room. Some of you are not parents yet, and you're holding up your hands <laughs> saying, it's tough. It's tough being a kid today. You know, sometimes we need to understand these things. It is true. There's a certain kind of sophistication. There's, a certain, there's certain kinds of experiences and, and with technology and everything else that goes on that um, makes parenting a challenging, challenging kind of vocation in terms of, of life and, and building relationships with, with children. I'll give you a little example. Um, there, was a, there was a dad who was doing family devotions with his children, and they were, they were looking at the Old Testament book of Jonah, and he was telling them the story of Jonah. Now, Jonah ran away from God, and how, how it was that uh, Jonah got on this ship, and, and it started to sail out into the deep waters of the Mediterranean, and God knew exactly where Jonah was, and God sent this great storm, and the sailors could not manage their way through the storm and the waves and the wind and all of this stuff. Finally, they had to throw Jonah off the ship and into the sea, and he was swallowed by a huge fish. Jonah and the whale, right? So dad had told this story. He had embellished it enough so that it was dramatic and it was like a good TV documentary. You know, you just want to hang in there till we get to the end where the fish spits Jonah up on the shore and he goes to do what God told him to do. And so dad looks at, uh, looks at his kiddos and he says, what lesson have you learned tonight by hearing the story of Jonah? seven-year-old held up the hand, and he said, always travel by air. <laughs> and um, I suppose that's okay, don't you? But uh, Dad was probably looking for something a little bit, uh, a little bit different. So, um, parenting today and the issue of rebooting your life. Remember when Pastor Tucker began this series last week and we were talking about marriage and, of course, during Lent we're looking at all of the 
kinds of applications for this and in, in just in our own spiritual life and growth. The notion of rebooting, uh, kind of getting this fresh new start, if we took an ancient word, if we took a biblical word and we put it down and said, this is what we're talking about, that word would be repentance. And I, and I want to, just so that we're clear in terms of our, our mental models and what it is that we're learning and, and trying to do, uh, what I, what I want to be clear on is a definition of repentance, okay? The New Testament word for that is metanoia. You don't need to write that down, but let me give you this definition. The definition is this, change the way you think and act. When Jesus Christ begins his earthly ministry, he says the kingdom of God is at hand, Mark chapter 1. His first words of public proclamation, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is now. The kingdom of God is relevant. The kingdom of God is with you. Repent and believe what? The gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. Change the way you have thought and acted and believe now the gospel. The good news for those people in that ancient day when Jesus was saying, believe the gospel, understand that, that, that you're not going to be good enough. Understand that imperfection is a part of being human. But understand that the gift of God is eternal life through me. That's what Jesus is saying. The gift of God is eternal life through me. Repent and believe. Repent. Change the way you think and act and trust. That's what it means to believe. Trust in me. So just note for when we're talking about rebooting and when you hear me talking about rebooting, we're going to be talking about this whole idea of repentance changing the way that you think and act. So let's, um, let's kind of move on. I'm having just a little problem here. Is, is there someone who knows that button? I was looking to see if Adair was still here in the room because I'm not connected to the Wi-Fi from this distance. I'm not sure. Anybody know how to hit the little button that advances the slide? If not, Guess what? We'll just talk about some of these pictures, all right, and uh, do this thing. If you look into, oh, can you, can you, are you okay with that? There we go. Yes, sir. Thank you. We're looking at 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 33. Let me just set this up for a moment because we're talking about a parenting issue, and the issue is with David and with his children. Okay, it's with David and his children. So, as we move into this uh, circumstance, what has happened is his son, one of his sons, whose name was Absalom, one of his sons had taken up cause against his father. We'll talk about this in just a little bit. Taken up cause against his father. Built people around him who also would, would connect with Absalom's complaint, Absalom's uh, disregard for his dad until finally he had enough of an army to lead a coup against his dad. That's an amazing thing. He's going to lead this coup against his dad. And while the battles are going on, there is a watchman on the walls who is overlooking uh, the, the battlefield, and he sees a messenger who is coming to announce the outcome of the, of the battle. And let me just read this. Uh, it was a part of our Scripture reading. It, it is a part of the Scripture reading in our worship services today. While David was sitting between the inner and outer gates, the watchman went up the roof of the gateway by the wall. He looked out. He saw a man running. The watchman called out to the king and reported it. The king said, if he is alone, he must have good news. The man came closer and closer. Then the Cushite arrived and said, My lord, the king, hear the good news. The Lord has delivered you today from all who rose up against you. Now that is like a clap of thunder in the head of David because the word all. This is the good news, David. Everyone who has risen up against you, all of them, all of them, um, you have been delivered from them. May the enemies, and, and the king asked the Cushite, is the young man Absalom safe? And the Cushite replied, may the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up to harm you be like that young man. The king was shaken. He went over to the room, over the gateway, and he wept. 
And this is what he said. Let's read this out loud together. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. As he said, as he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you, oh, Absalom, my son. Let me just say a word about, about this word. David was a parent, clearly. David loved his son. But as you will see as we press into this story, that there was enough dysfunction within that home, enough dysfunction within that home, that uh, damage was irreversible and uh, the outcome irreversible. And Absalom, as an enemy of the king, would be killed by one of David's trusted warriors whose name was Joab. It's kind of a tragic thing. Long hair, handsome young man, riding on a mule, escaping from the armies of David, his father, and his hair is caught in the branches of a tree, and he's hanging there by his hair. And the Bible says Joab approached him and stabbed him with his spear three times through the heart. Here's the good news, David. You've been delivered from all of your enemies. And it was like David's world had come to an end. Let's just kind of stop at that point, okay, shall we? Let's just stop at that point and let's back up for just a minute. And let's think about parenting. Let's think about the gift of, of a child. Let's think about the, 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 the uh, attitude and, and perception and direction of all of this. I was thinking about uh, this week as I was preparing this lesson, I was thinking about what it was like when I held my, my uh, daughter for the first time. I was thinking about what it was like when I held my son for the first time. And you're holding this little, this little baby in your arms, and you're going, oh, my goodness, what has just happened here? And, but you realize that there is a whole world ahead of them. There is all of these life experiences. And one of the things that, that uh, I came across as a, a dad thinking about his children was what's printed in your outline here, which is called The Parents' Creed by Dr. Robert and Arvella Schuler. If we can go to the next uh, slide, please. If you look at that, let me read this with you or for you. I believe that my children are a gift of God, the hope of a new tomorrow. I believe that immeasurable possibilities lie slumbering in each son and daughter. I believe that God has planned a has planned a perfect plan for their life and that his love shall always surround them. And so I believe that they shall grow up, first crawling, then toddling, then standing, stretching skyward for a decade and a half until they reach full stature, a man and a woman. I believe that they can and will be molded and shaped between infancy and adulthood as a tree is shaped by a gardener, as the clay vessel in the potter's hand, or the shoreline of the sea under the watery hand of the mighty waves, by home and church, by school and street, through the sights and sounds and touch of my hand on their hand, and Christ's Spirit in their heart. So, I believe that they shall mature as only people can through laughter and tears, through trial and error, by reward and punishment, through affection and discipline until they stretch their wings and leave the nest to fly. And then he writes these words, and let's say these out loud together. O oh God, I believe in my children. Help me so to live that they may always believe in me and so in thee. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? So I'm reading this little parent's creed, and I'm holding babies in my arms, and I'm thinking, this is that. And I don't think that my life is so different from what your life might be as you think back to maybe a moment like that one. And I don't think that my life is so different from what David's life may have been. The thrill of holding a child in his arms and believing good things for this child's future and, and who and what that good child would be. But there were difficulties. There were problems for David and for 
his children. We're going to step into a story today that is, um, I, I'm just going to say it, it's pretty dark. <laughs> the secrets from inside the palace are going to be exposed. And we're going to see in David someone perhaps as a person that we don't really like because there's some things here that just become repulsive, things that we we don't have place for in our hearts and in our lives. That's where I have been. That's where we will go as we go through the Scriptures. But here's the thing that I want you to remember because it really is a point of hope for me. When we fast forward from these from this difficult home experience, from this dysfunctional and broken relationship between a father and a son, when we fast forward into the New Testament, we are deeply moved and deeply impressed when the Apostle Paul would stand and talk about the hand of God upon his people. And he would use the time when David was king as an example of how God brings blessing. And this is how the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts would describe David. He would say, he was a man after what? God's own heart. He was a man who would pursue God. So I step back from a statement like that and I step into a story like this and I'm trying to learn and, and, and kind of put my arms around what it means to be a, a father again because though I don't have small children living in my home, I do have children. And one lives in my home and one is married and doesn't live too far from my home. I'm still a dad. And somehow, somehow, I find a sense of of encouragement in the fact that even the darkest imperfections can still be brought to, through rebooting, repenting to a place where David's legacy would be a man after God's own heart. And I'm reminded because as a dad, I've got my own imperfections, you know. There's plenty of stuff along the way that, that is imperfect for me. So I repent. Change the way you think and act, Steve, toward your children. Get in the game. Do it well. And I'm encouraged to know that in my worst moments, God is bigger than my worst moments. And his grace and his goodness does not call me to continue to repeat and replicate the dark moments. He calls me to a place that simply says, forgiven. Desire my heart. Desire me. Know my son, Jesus Christ. Follow him and see the blessing that he can bring to your family. See that blessing. So let's look for just a moment and uh, go on to the next page here uh, as we're talking about, and we're, we're going to uh, the slide that is talking about parenting. And, and the first little point on this slide is that we want to create the context of David's agonizing cry. Let's do that. Let's begin, though. Let's, let's, let's step back for just a minute and let's Let's talk about Absalom, and we want to say, how do you get from where David was to the place of who Absalom is? And, and how does he get to such an agonizing, desperate cry? If you recall, and, and I would ask you to go back to 2 Samuel uh, chapter 12 at this point. If you, I, I'm sorry, I should have said something about opening your Bibles to um, the 1 Samuel 18. But let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 12. And what has happened in David's life is that he is a king, his armies are at war, and uh, one of his soldiers has left his wife, whose name is Bathsheba, at home. David used that occasion to have a, uh, an immoral relationship with, uh, with this woman. And finally, there's a confrontation that occurs. Oh, and, and by the way, to cover up his moral indiscretion, he has his, uh, his officers of his army 
put Uriah, the husband, on the front lines of the battle so that there's a higher probability that he would be killed. And of course he is. And David now is set free to continue his relationship with Bathsheba. The prophet Nathan comes to David and basically tells him the story about a poor man who had a lamb and a rich man who had many, many sheep, and the rich man was inviting people over for company and, and uh, took the poor man's single sheep and, and, and slaughtered it and had that for his meal. What should happen to a fellow like that? That was the question. What happens to a fellow like that? David said, take his life. And Nathan looked at David and he said, David, you are what? The man. David is brought to this great uh, brokenness and repentance. He knew instantly that he would want to, need to reboot his life. And in the context of all of that, most Bible commentators say that Psalm 51 was uh, one of those psalms that he pinned during this season of his life. And if you know Psalm 51 well, you know it says things like this, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Don't turn away from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Because when I'm alone, the only thing that, that I can think about and it haunts me is the sin and the darkness of my life. You're the one. And when Nathan calls David to reboot, he also says this in a prophetic sense uh, concerning uh, David's uh, f home, or David's family. Why did you despise the word of the Lord? By doing what is evil in his eyes. I'm at verse um, 9, chapter 12, verse 9, 2 Samuel 12, verse 9. You struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword, and you took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house, because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. How many of you believe that God's word is always true? <laughs> yeah. How many of you understand that while sin can be forgiven, sometimes consequences still need to be dealt with? You understand? Sure you do. I do. So David, the clean heart that you prayed for is indeed going to be given to you by God. But hear this, understand this. The violence, the darkness, the immorality will remain in your home. And so David, with his multiple wives, gives birth to multiple children. The first son uh, that David gave birth to was called Ammon, and uh, he saw a, his, in his half-sister a woman that he desired, and uh, he sexually assaulted her. Guess who knew about all of that? Absalom. Because she was Absalom's sister. And guess what Absalom did? He came to David and he said, David, this is a horrible thing. This is like a nightmare. We want to, we've got to do something. And you know what David did? Nothing. Nothing. For two years, nothing. You see, when we accommodate sin in our own lives, we tend to accommodate sin in the lives of others. Do you know what Absalom did after the two years was up? After he spent time now talking about how his father wasn't leading well in, in terms of the nation, how he would be a better leader, how he would listen better, how he would have more compassion for people, how he would make provision for people. Doesn't that sound like kind of a campaign deal like what some of this is going on right now? It may sound a little bit familiar. Some things just don't change, right? We, everything's going to be better if I were your king. And he came to a place where he had amassed an army. And this is a really interesting thing because if you turn to 2 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 21, he receives this um, advice 
from one of his friends. And, he sa- and the friend says, Lie with your father's concubines whom he left to take care of the palace. Then all Israel will hear that you have made yourself a stench in your father's nostrils and the hands of everyone with you will be strengthened. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof. That was the roof of the palace of David. And he lay with his father's concubines in the sight of all of Israel. In the very home where David had practiced immorality in secret, Absalom practiced it in front of everyone. And do you know what that meant? Do you know what that was? It was was a way in that ancient world of saying, you are weak, you are over, all that you have now belongs to me. It was the beginning of the coup. And it happened right out in front of everyone. And it happened because David gave in to sin, sought forgiveness. Nathan told him there would be a consequence, and yet he did nothing, did nothing, did nothing to address the consequence. How much dysfunction is that? I mean, good grief. I read this story and I'm going, I'm doing pretty doggone good, you know, as a dad and none of this stuff going on in my house. Brokenness, imperfection. You know the end of the story. David, a man after God's own heart. Wow. Let's talk about this for just a minute because there, there, are, there is a context for, these, um, for David's agonizing cry. Oh, Absalom, if it had only been me. Okay? So let's talk about these relational gaps. First Samuel, that, that one means first. Uh, Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. Let me talk to you about that story for just a moment. Because there are incredible relational parenting gaps in the life of David. This, for me, is, at least is one of them. And we're going to kind of flash back a little bit here to um, when David was just a young man. He was just a, um, in South Texas, we'd probably say he was a strapping young guy. You know, he, he, was, he was a dude. You know, we'd, we'd talk about David as a young man. And it was at a time when uh, judges, the, the, the um, downward spiral of, of spirituality and, and, and uh, faithfulness to God had just hit rock bottom, and God gave to Israel the king that they wanted. And his name was Saul. And Saul only increased the debauchery of that time. So God said to Samuel, go to the house of Jesse. Go find Jesse, and one of his sons will be the king. So Samuel comes and announces himself and says, I've come to anoint one of your sons as king. And so Jesse, I'm sure he's thinking, all right. You know, he's going to leverage this moment just a little bit. I'm sure he's, he's pretty excited about this proud dad moment. You know, hey, I'm we, we got a king here in the house. And um, so he starts bringing the, the big boys in, you know, the, the handsome guys in, the uh, rippled guys in. And, and, uh, and, and Samuel's looking at them one after one after one after one. And he has every one of his sons come to meet Samuel, every one of them to engage Samuel. And Samuel says, no, no. No, this is not one. No, this is not the one. And then Samuel has to ask this question: Is that, is that all of them? Now you remember, the, you remember the story. You know where I'm going with this story. Where was David? David was one of the sons of Jesse. David was out in the fields. David was being a shepherd. There was no more blue collar kind of work. Nothing that was more. I, I'm just going to. Just going to say it. Nothing that was was more disgusting day in and day out. Nothing that was more difficult day in and day out than being a shepherd. So guess who got sort of in quotes the dirty work? It was David. Guess whose father doesn't even can't even conceive that David would be a part of this moment in any way at all. He didn't invite him in. He sent him out and gave him the most menial and most disgusting tasks of all the brothers. What does that feel like to you? 
What if dad did that to you? And then when it's time at the word of God, bring all of the children at the word of the prophet of God, Jesse leaves David in the field. You're not invited to the party. You, in my opinion, dad's opinion, could never be king. Nathan has to tell Jesse, you look at the outside of things, God looks at the inside of things. He wants David. And David is made king in the context of something that has to leave a person at least wondering, am I loved? Um, Am I valued? Is there appreciation? Is there a, is, is there a sense of, of uh, honor toward me? My father is ashamed of me. I don't get invited in. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Can you sort of feel that? There's a gap here with David, a gap. It shows up later again, same pattern, later Again, and it shows up in his relationship with Absalom. Second Samuel 11, beginning at verse 1, is the story of, um, of Bathsheba. It's the story of the immorality. It's the story of the adultery. Now, let me ask you again about this. What are the kinds of things relationally? What are the kinds of things emotionally that is going on inside of a person who thinks that their very best option, that thinks and gives permission to consider this option of taking another man's wife and then planning that other man's murder? What are the gaps? What are the holes? Here's what I know. Here's what I know. In people that I talk to, Something like that is such an, an, an incredulous escape from, from, from pain, from disappointment, from, from disillusionment, from uh, um, a, a, a sense of, of not being uh, valued, of, of, of not being um, loved. And it pours out into these kinds of, of circumstances of escape. I just need to get away from this. I, um, (laughs) what's coming to my head is I deserve a break today. So I'll just invite Bathsheba into the palace. It's a gap. It's a hole. And when you survive these gaps, these holes, when you don't address the gaps in terms of your life, and address and restore the relationship in the way that God would have it be. The consequence continues. I'm really kind of a busy guy because I'm king. I'll get to Amnon another day. We'll have a conversation about that sexual assault on Tamar. One day goes by, one week goes by, one month goes by, one year goes by, da-da-da-da, two years, and finally there is a full-blown assault on you driven by the anger and the bitterness and the disappointment and, and the, the hatred of your own son. But you see, when you have relational gaps, anger, hatred, bitterness are a part of your relational history. Let's look at this next point. Relational gaps create, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Adair, go back to the previous point number uh, three. Relational gaps create relational gaps. Let me just give you quickly um, these two Bible verses. Exodus chapter 20, verses three through six. Uh, I just want to read this one to you because I want to be absolutely specific and and straight up on target. I tend to um, sometimes make Scripture a paraphrase, and I want to make it a translation here, because it's dealing with the first commandment. Now listen carefully to what God is saying here, because He explains this commandment. The commandment in Exodus 20, verse 3 is, you shall have no other gods before me, okay? You will have no other gods before me. Another god before me is adultery. It's uh, adultery. It's idolatry. 
So we go on to verse 4. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now, here's the deal. No idolatry here, folks. Okay, don't, no, no idolatry of any kind. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, what does that mean? Why does God punish my kid for, me, for what I do? We have to understand something about this notion of, of uh, punishment and, and, and the jealousy of God. For God to be jealous is not sort of the, the, the kind of petty stuff that sometimes we see in, in these little romantic relationships and things like that. This isn't, we're not talking Hallmark Channel here, okay? That's why I, I just want to make sure you, you get that one. We're not talking Hallmark Channel. We're understanding that God has said, no other God before me, and I am jealous for that position. I am jealous to be the center piece and focus of your attention and your affection, your love, your determinations. I'm a, I am jealous for that place. It belongs to me. Guys, that's good news. God does care about you and me, and he cares about uh, who we are and the direction that our life is going. And what's at the centerpiece of life? Because he wants to bless you and bless me, but not just once, to the thousandth generation of those who follow. I told my wife one time, I said, Rita, you and I have said a lot of stuff to our kids over the years, and as soon as they have kids, we'll learn what they thought was important. That's when we'll know when they were listening and they were agreeing. I punish the children for the sin of the fathers. What is he talking about here? There's three things that sin um, is. There are sins of omission. There, the sins are, yeah, let me, let me say it like this. There are sins of omission. Uh, that is the things that we should do that we don't. There are sins of commission. Those are the things that we do, but we shouldn't. And there are sins that are called iniquity. Now, what is an iniquity? Because that's what he's talking about right here. It is an intergenerational tendency toward a particular kind of sin. Lust is one of those iniquities. Violence is one of those iniquities. When my lust becomes more important to me than God himself, that is absolutely idolatrous. And when I practice that in a way that, uh, that, that uh, attends my life, I'm not just doing this alone. I can't begin to tell you how many times I've heard people say uh, in, in trying to rationalize some sort of, of just frankly, just immorality saying it doesn't hurt anybody. It doesn't hurt anybody. Let me tell you what, if, if you allow a, a, that, that type of, of, of exception to God's Word in your life, it will show up in other places in your life, and it will show up in the generations that are connected to you. And what God is not saying, He's not talking about omission and commission, you know, well, kids didn't do anything. He's talking about iniquity. He is saying there are certain things that we don't pass on, and that's that. And parenting, a part of rebooting, is, 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 is understanding this and understanding it well. So that if we're to guard our hearts in this way, that God is jealous for that centerpiece, we can flash forward to Mark chapter 12, where Jesus is answering the question, what is the greatest commandment that we have? What's the greatest commandment? And in Mark chapter 12, Jesus says it like this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. Now, he's about to tell them what he thinks is the greatest commandment, but it's not original with him. It goes all the way back to Deuteronomy. It's in the Hebrew language. It's called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God, and you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. 
And what God is saying, it all belongs to me. David was a man who pursued the heart of God. David was a man whom God saw as a young man and said, I want him to be the king. But do you think God was surprised by the adultery? No, he wasn't surprised by the adultery. But he saw something beyond all of that, and he understood the the power of the reboot and the forgiveness of sins that is yours and mine. So that while while my imperfections may haunt me, And my imperfections may show up different sort of expression, but the same root cause and root perspective and root values that that showed up in my life. The confidence that I can have in God is that through Jesus Christ, my sins are forgiven. And when I kneel down, when, when I'm leading our worship on Sunday mornings, and I say, let's make confession of our sins. You can kneel, remain seated. And I see moms and dads and children and grandparents and, and grandchildren, and we're kneeling before God, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. One of the things that I understand in that moment is that God is breaking, God is preventing, God is at work repairing the sorts of things that would destroy me and the kids that are living with me and watching me. It's bigger than just me. And so I, I grab on to these things, and I'm, gonna, and, I'm, and I'm sitting here to say all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength, all of that belongs to God. I love this little poem by uh, Betty Burnett, Roots and Wings. Just listen as we read this. Give them food, give them clothes. These are needful, heaven knows. Give them bikes and cowboy boots. But first of all, give them what? Roots. You'll need those roots when the storms come. Stand strong. You'll need those roots for the nourishment that it brings, the health that they can bring. Be their guide. You won't always be at their side with all these things, but don't forget, give them wings. You're not trying to create some kind of codependency. You're trying to create a person who's strong, able to stand in an independent way so that they're ready to engage, should that be God's purpose and will, in an interdependent way. Let them soar. Let them see life an open door. You may skip some other things, but give them roots and give them wings. How many of you would say that's a pretty good thought? Give them roots and give them wings. By the way, there's nothing that implies technology in any of this, you know. When I sometimes know that something's going on in, in a home is when I see kids who've got all the latest gadgets, you know, and all the stuff. And it makes me sort of say, I hope that's not a substitute. I hope God has just blessed them in extraordinary ways. And it's not a substitute for dad who's too busy and he's gone. For mom who's distracted and, and um, likes the kids to get to bed early so that she has some time for herself. And I'm not, I'm not putting down gifts. I'm not putting down any you know, time for yourself. These are all lovely things, but they are not substitutes, you see. They're not substitutes. One of the things that is absolutely, um, absolutely um, significant and, and important is the fact that you are there. Absalom became a, a, a volcano of hatred toward his father because his dad took two years and did nothing concerning the sexual assault of his own daughter. Nothing. So we get to the roots and the wings, give them roots and give them wings. And of high importance in this process is the idea that that Genesis talks about, which is the idea of leaving and cleaving. You remember when uh, God created the the man and the woman. First, he created the man. If you go back to Genesis chapter 2, he created the man. And, um, and, and in perfection, this always kind of startles me. In, in perfection, God says to Adam, um, this is not good. And I'm going, how good, how much 
better at perfection, how much better can perfection get? I mean, perfect is perfect, isn't that right? How much better can it get? It's not good for you to be alone. Now, the Hebrew word for alone is more than just a physical aloneness. It is an aloneness of uh, intellect and emotion and, and spirituality. It's not good for you to be alone. I've talked to people who um, get stuck, young people who come to talk to me before they get married and things like that. And one may be a very coming out of a, a family uh, home where the church has been a very important part of it. Um, he or she was confirmed in their faith, perhaps, in a Lutheran family, and, and this is a big deal. And the partner is somebody who's saying, you know, it's okay. It's not for me, but it's okay. And one of the things that I try to create so that it's not just so off-putting that they get up and walk out the door, but one of the things that I try to do is to help them sense that what God wants for them is the very best in their marriage. He wants the very best for the the children that they will bring into the world as they are parents, wants the best. And I'll look at the person who, uh, who is uh, the one saying, okay, I'm the one who wants to be to church, but we haven't quite settled on a church yet, we haven't been going to church yet. And I said, let me just ask you this. Can you imagine being married six days a week and everything is we, but you're single on Sunday morning? Is that what you want? I've never had a person respond to me by saying, yes, that's exactly what I want. I aspire to that. And my response to them is always this. Get back, have the conversations, talk this thing through, and understand that if you wait until after marriage to try to resolve this, um, there's a high probability it won't be resolved, and you will be single on Sunday. God wants you to have a spiritual connection. That's what one f flesh is all about. It's not good, Adam, for you to be alone. I'm going to make a helpmate for you. And so you know about the, uh, uh, you know about the, uh, the, the dust and the breath, and, and he brings to Adam this woman. Now, Adam's response in, in English here in my Bible says, now this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Um, it sort of omits the Hebrew word. Uh, it doesn't do justice to the Hebrew word that Adam actually uh, spoke because the Hebrew word would start that sentence off like this. Wow, this is bone of my bone. This is flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman. Wow. And God says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Here's why rebooting is important in the whole notion of parenting. Because if we're not able to reboot and we don't understand, we'll have people who are never able to leave emotionally. They'll never be able to leave relationally. They'll move physically. They can be married physically. But the same sort of brokenness that occurred in the home continues because the emotional focus is still back behind them. Let's go to the next slide, uh, Adair, thank you. Leaving and cleaving has to do with these kinds of things. Keys to relational health, affection, affection. Let me say something about affection, that it is unconditional. It's not a sort of, con it's not conditioned on behavior. I love you, dear, because you, you uh, picked up your room and, and made your bed this morning. That's a, parent talking to a child. I, I love you for this. Uh, it's unconditional. I love you when you don't make your bed. Now, we're going to talk about that, but I love you. And one of the things that, that I would just encourage you to be thinking about is, is, is there any reason in the generations that are behind me, is there any reason why any one of those who were connected to me in family would have any doubt concerning my absolute love for them, absolute, unconditional love for them? I will tell you that you are giving them a gift that is the exception to the rule. We get it that if we do good, we get good. But if we do poorly, then we're treated poorly. No, God says, my affection for you is 
unconditional. How is that communicated, parent to child? Secondly, are boundaries. The word that I want you to write next to affection is the word unconditional. The word I want you to write next to boundaries is clear. And, and what that means is that in advance of a difficulty, we're helping people learn some boundaries. It's, it's a frightening thing to learn them after you've stepped over one and didn't know it. And now you're punished for it. So we want a, some rules. We want some boundaries between what's right and wrong, between what we value and we don't value, what we say yes to, what we say no to. Fewer rules with consistent um, maintenance care of those rules are better than rules. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Few boundaries, clear boundaries. When I was growing up <coughs> here in San Antonio with my parents, and when uh, I got to be a little older and, and I kind of liked going out on Friday night and Saturday night, and I had some buddies, and, and uh, one of them had a car, and you start to date and all that kind of stuff. I remember um, my dad called me in to talk to me one day, and he said, uh, son, I know you're going out tonight. This was on a Saturday night. And he said, um, I, I just want you to be real clear about something. Tomorrow morning, we'll be at Concordia at 8 o'clock. You will be with us. And we will go to Sunday school, and then we will come home. We will be on time. That was my, my, my father was a stickler, being on time. And on time for him at about 10 minutes early, sitting in the pew, you know. So uh, we're talking about 6, 7, 20, 7, 15, rise, shine, give God the glory. Shoes will be polished, you know, stuff is going to. And that was, I was pretty clear about that. He says, so you just tell me what time you think you're going to get home. Well, in that case, Dad, I'll probably be home before midnight. Where are you going to go? I'll kill you. That's okay. So go, go where you told me you're going to go and be home before midnight. That's kind of how we did that. Now, there was a day when I thought it would be a, probably a good idea, if, especially if I could sort of groan a little bit. And, and there was a Saturday night. It got a little late, and I came in and sort of groaned and whatnot and said, oh, man, I'm just, I think I'm sick today. I'm, I'm, I just I can't make it to church. This is not a good day for me, Dad. I'm sorry. I'm just not going. And he said, okay, um, we'll be back, and we'll see how you're doing later. So we came back, and how are you doing? Well, you know, Dad, I, I'm feeling a little bit better now. Thanks very much. And he looked at me, and he said, son, you really don't look like you're feeling all that much better. Back to bed. I, so I sort of had my jeans on and my shirt, and I pulled back some covers. He said, no, put your pajamas on. Back to bed. Mom will be bringing you some medication here shortly. I'm going, oh, my God. <laughs> Let me just say this to you. Let me just say this to you. Not only was it clear before I stayed out too late, it was crystal clear after one time of saying, I don't think I'm going to join the family today in church. I understood something about boundaries. So few rules, very clear, and care that is consistent. Care that is consistent. It's just putting in deposits over time, when someone says, are you proud enough to bring me all of your children? Are you, are you excited to introduce to me all of your sons? And you say, here they are. And the person has to say, isn't there someone else? Oh, yeah. Care that is consistent. I will care for you. I will know you. I will love you. I will support you, I will guide you, I will direct you. My prayer is that you will have roots and you will have wings. Stop passing on the inconsistency. I want to close with a little story here. Um, regrets trigger reboots. I was um, visiting with a pastor friend of mine. He happened to be a Baptist, but I never held that against him. Uh, he was just a good, as we would say in South Texas, Bible-believing guy. You know, he loved Jesus, and he was sold out. We were talking about teaching this Genesis 2 thing about leaving and cleaving, and he asked me after uh, we were finished, he said, uh, Steve, are your kids, or have, you, have you got them ready to leave? I had shared him a little poem about roots and wings. He said, have you given them wings yet? And I'm going... Well, what do you mean? I, I said, they can leave whenever they need to. They're getting old enough. They'll be off to school and off. And he said, no, no, no. 
He said, they have to leave and flee. Have you, have you, uh, um, have you, have you prepared them to leave? I said, what do you mean? He said, here's what I'm finding is important. He said, I'm not talking about physically moving, but I'm talking about emotionally being able to leave. He said, you're not a perfect parent. And he said, I'm just going to guess that there are some times in your children's lives that you've disappointed them, that you've misunderstood them, that you've hurt them, that you've been inconsistent with them. Not wanting to debate this for a long season about what an excellent parent I thought I was, I said, well, I'm sure there are, but what are you getting at? He said, I would encourage you to take each of them out to dinner by themselves, take them to a very nice restaurant, and look them in the eye when they have completed a meal that they love and say to them, if there is anything in your life, any time in your life when I have hurt you, or disappointed you, been confused, er, been confusing to you, and it's caused you anxiousness or pain in any way, I want to apologize. Can we talk about it? Now, I took my kids, so I said, okay, okay, I'm gonna, that sounds pretty good. That's pretty cool. If that's what you got to do, that's what I'm going to do. So I told Rita, I said, uh, I'm taking... Leah, out, we're going to have dinner, and, and by the way, I'll be back early because she's not going to have an answer to this question, you know, when you're, <laughs> you know, as the Germans would say, ich bin am besten, you know, so I'm a great dad, and, and uh, I'm sure she's not going to have an answer. Sat her down, I said, there's no, re there's no recrimination here. I really need to know if there's ever been a time in your life where I've hurt you, misunderstood you, confused you, created anxiousness in your life. Uh, I'd like for us to talk about that because I would like to apologize to you. And I thought there's going to be this long, awkward silence, and we're going to go back. Do you know what? She had an answer about that quick. And you know why? Because I had made an emotional deposit. I had made a relational error that still brought pain. It didn't matter how many years back. It was. If she can remember it that quickly, it's pain. And she brought something to me, and I said to her, for this, and I restated it, I'm very sorry. I'm asking God to forgive me, and I'm asking you to forgive me. And she did. Well, we went home. We had this great trip back then things are light and good and we walk in the door later than I told my wife I'd be there and she said she had an answer didn't she and I said yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes as a matter of fact she did <clears throat> so now it's time to take my son out to dinner we go out for him it would be more like a sports bar you know but it, we, we didn't have a place to talk so we're going to go to a nice place we're going to have dinner blah 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 Lance has there ever been a time and you know what he had an answer. Here's what I want to say to you in regards to this as it connects to rebooting. Don't assume that it doesn't make any difference. Don't assume that it's been so many years. Don't assume that the pain will not have effect later. Don't assume that the very pain that was created in your life by someone else wouldn't also be pain for a generation that you may not even see born. Stop passing it on. And the only way to get past those things is to bring them to God and to bring them to the person that you've injured. And for me, it was my son and my daughter. It was a humbling tearful moment, but it was important so that they were prepared to leave and cleave to another and build their home upon the good memories and the good values and the good things that Rita and I were committed to sharing, their roots and their wings. Let's pray. Father, <clears throat> 
Thank you for the huge privilege that is ours to reboot. Perhaps like David, we would say, create in me a clean heart, O God. Perhaps like my friend encouraged me, there's a conversation that needs to take place. Whatever it may be, let it be, Lord, so that we stop passing it on. So that we don't come to that place of anguish like David who said, Absalom, my son, my son, I would have died for you. But the damage had already been done. The brokenness was done. And there was no way to go back and repair it. Lord Jesus, in your death and rising again, we have the full promise and potential of repair no matter how deep the damage. And so, Lord, we bring our lives our families, to you. And we ask, Lord, create in us clean hearts. Renew in us the joy <clears throat> of our salvation. And let us stand in that great line of homes and families that you promise to bless to the thousandth generation. And to that end, we offer this prayer in Jesus' strong and precious name. Amen.